Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing today? This is Professor Hamamoto coming to you. Let's see, anybody in the live chat? Are you there? I guess it's populating. But according to the uh, feedback I'm getting here, I'm, I'm live. So let me begin here. As promised, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and I say little because this is a, a, a really huge topic. There's, there's an incredible body of uh, research and literature on this. But um, I'm going to be talking specifically about, as I alluded to yesterday, in talking about Sonny and Cher, Sonny Bono in particular, about this book that I just happened to pick up out of pure serendipity. And um, in fact, C.G. Jung himself, Carl Gustav Jung himself, uh, coined a term that's in common use. You might not know where it originates, but it comes from Jung himself. He called it synchronicity. Some may call it uh, coincidence, but uh, I was called out to, to reach out for this book and I was immediately became engrossed in it. I, I bought it almost a year ago. So I'm going to talk about it because it's quite relevant. The contents here are quite relevant to what's uh, going on in this hotly contested election 2020. And uh, but, but before I start, I wanted to thank you for all your comments for the previous two or three talks that I've given, the Lego one, for example. One commentator said that um, and she had made a, a remark about one of her, I think it was a grandson who fell in this category of what I call the shoegazer. I, I didn't mean it in a disparaging term, but she wrote back and reported that uh, she's got him out uh, working in the garden and he seems to be coming around. So this is the type of um, interventions I think we're going to need in order to get through um, this uh, longstanding crisis that we're in. I appreciate that comment. Someone also provided information about ABS plastic uh, as a remark or a comment on the uh, Lego piece. And uh, I'm not accusing Lego of creating health problems along with um, its, um, its uh, what I believe to be social engineering tasks. I'm not making that accusation at all, but this person remarked that ABS plastic is indeed, it's a chemical compound that is indeed a, a could be considered a carcinogen. And I don't know if uh, Lego labels it as, as such. I'll, I'll leave that for you to, to uh, discuss. All I know is that this, if it's true, um, this wouldn't be the first time that consumer products have some kind of a strange chemical compound in there that are not healthy for the human beings or the environment. I want to welcome the Patreon supporters in specific. I appreciate your support. Uh, I'm trying to upgrade this program all the time. I'm trying to make it more professional. And um, as I mentioned, I, <laughs> I have um, huge, uh, grandiose perhaps, ambitions to break into the, uh, the world of news, inter news information and very importantly, entertainment, not entrainment, entertainment. And I say this because a lot of this research is very dark. It's very dismal. It's very disheartening. And we always have to remember to celebrate life, right? All major religious traditions have a, have a, have a time of festivity, of carnival. And we have to keep that in mind to, so that we can maintain balance in our lives so that we do not get... Uh, pulled into the abyss, down into the vortex. Because if we do, that's exactly what <laughs> the bad guys want. And we're not going to let that happen. So news, information, and entertainment, very important. Now, for the Patreon supporters, I'm going to give you an interesting, or I'm going to post it on the Patreon site, a very interesting one. And uh, if you are interested, we can perhaps discuss this on our own, or perhaps make this uh, part of another uh, presentation here. It's an interesting article, and I haven't read it myself, but I, I was attracted to the title, and, and I will read it now that I'm uh, 
giving it to you, but the title is C.G. Jung and Norman Cohn Explain Pizzagate. And the subtitle is The Archetypal Dimension of a Conspiracy Theory. And without even reading it, I think I know where this author is going to be taking the argument or the pseudo argument. And the reason why I put this out at the front of this talk here is that um, don't worry about being called a conspiracy theorist. It's, uh, <laughs> it's almost fashionable nowadays, <laughs> given the revelations that... Uh, have been put out there over the past four years. It seemed like when uh, President Trump was elected, the the dam busted so far as all these suppressed bits of information and analysis that people going back decades have been talking. People such as Ted Gunderson, who I talked about yesterday, who were, who were reviled and ridiculed and mocked for. So if you are a... Um, conspiracy theorist, then I think you should own it and, and embrace the identity. Welcome to the club. Uh, the, these jerk zoids who write articles like this, um, they, they're losing traction really, really quickly. We're on the rise, not the conspiracy theorists, but I think the people who have a legitimate interest in the occult, in occult knowledge, in classical learning, are going to be rewarded. Guess where? In the university. All the identity politics material is going to go out. And as I've been foretelling for the past 10 years, areas such as this woman here, this author, her name is Lynn uh, Brunet or Brunette. I don't know how she pronounces it. This type of literature is going to be part become part of the, the, the standard curriculum instead of um, identity X, Y, and Z. That's, that's played out um, to, to to the end point, we, we're, we're seeing that. I mean, yeah, sure, there'll be some tenured professors that are still going on and on about it until they die. Most of these people do not change their notes from the time they're in grad school. They're just going off fumes for 40, 50 years in some cases, but they're not going to be taken seriously. And, and the, 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 the new uh, crop of students will be attracted to material like this. This is where I'm, I'm seeing it heading. So thank you again for your participation. I want to make this enterprise uh, participatory, especially since uh, it seems like I'm, you know, lecturing or, or talking to a screen as opposed to a, a live classroom. Uh, a brief disclaimer, if you want to call it that, because no, nah, it's not a disclaimer because I really don't care. <laughs> but the talk, this talk is not intended to critique, criticize, malign Freemasonry. I'm really indifferent to that. If, if you're a Freemason, then knock yourself out. And, and unless you're one of the people that are violating uh, moral or civil laws, then you have a problem. Then, then it has nothing to do with Masonry. It has to do with the fact that you're a criminal. Um, secondly, this is not a talk that, that is intended to disparage psychotherapy. Or more specifically, I'm not trying to critique or disparage Jung or his legacy, the analytic psychology mafia. Well, there I go. I've already started disparaging them by calling them a mafia. I know about academic cliques. I know about human cliques or cliques, if you want to call them, right? I know that people gather in little tribal groups and like to point the finger at him or her and say, oh, yeah, we're... We're the best. We're you know we're we're number one, right? I I love uh, when they used to have football. Are they still televising football? But I loved it and when they panned the crowds and there were these people with these foam fingers on their hands with a number one sign. Yeah, you're number one, all right. You're a number one fool. Anyway, I'm not intending here to malign an entire industry, the mental health of uh, psycho adjustment uh, industry. And of course, by my, my uh, sarcasm, you can tell that I don't put much store in it. Um, I'm quite skeptical, but it does have uh, some benefits. I, I, I assume I've never been in psychotherapy my, myself. I, I find better ways of uh, recreation and spending my money than to uh, talk to a complete stranger about the darkest secrets of my and, um, uh, the, the darkest thoughts that, that I possess. It doesn't really make any sense to me. But who knows, maybe one day I'll, I'll submit. Uh, I will say, however, that um, 
There is one individual in the history of psychoanalysis who never submitted to psychoanalysis himself. And this is grossly unfair because if you are a psychoanalyst, you have to undergo the psychoanalytic process yourself. That's part of the licensing process. And that individual is guess who? Granddaddy himself, Sigmund Freud, who I'll talk about in, in a moment, never submitted to psychoanalysis. I guess he was, you know, beyond that. He was above it. But if anybody needed his um his mind, his his soul probed by uh, I think his daughter did did a little bit of it informally, or he psychoanalyzed his own daughter. Gosh, that sounds so incestuous, but yeah, he was he himself was never um Anna Freud is her name. She's the keeper of the flame. Uh, not anymore, but she was. She was his uh, successor. But the great man himself was never uh, psychoanalyzed. I guess you can't psychoanalyze God. A brief note on how I personally came to uh, Carl Gustav Jung, C.G. Jung, or I'll just call him Jung for the sake of convenience, since some of you seem to like um, my my little uh, digressions into the past. But... Um, I came to Jung my very first semester in college. I took, a, I, I left high school one semester early. I took a bunch of summer session. I don't know how I did it, but, um, and, and I wrote for the school newspaper and, you know, but other than that, I, and I was in the band, the high school band and the orchestra. But other than that, I was not interested. I think the administrators knew this. So I was called into the, boy's vice principal office one day, and he says, um, well, you know, you have enough credits to um, graduate. Why don't you leave? <laughs> there was no hostility. There, I wasn't in trouble or anything. He just probably realized that I had outgrown high school. So instead of taking the rest of the year off, I immediately, uh, over the holidays, enrolled in Cal State Long Beach. That's one of the reasons why I didn't go to UC, which really doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, it was there, and you you plunk on your eighty nine dollars and fifty cents, which is what it cost to to attend State University back then, and and you're enrolled. It was a very simple process, so because I was anxious to get going, uh, and the very first semester I was at Cal State Long Beach, I took a course in Asian religions. This is in nineteen seventy one, and for those of you who were around back then, or for the younger people. You should understand that Asian religions were really, really big back then. It, it was part of the popular culture, and a lot of it had to do with the popularity brought by the Beatles with their voyage to India and studying briefly with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi or Mahesh Yogi and uh, studying transcendental meditation. You probably know the story, Mia Farrow, a number of different uh, beautiful people of the time, beautiful young people went to India. Some of the Beach Boys were there as well. They, the Beatles themselves wrote a couple of um, good songs while they're there, incredibly enough. And later on, of course, um, uh, John Lennon um, wrote a song expressing his uh, disillusionment with uh, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And the song is called Sexy Sadie, if you want to check it out. George Harrison, though, uh, maintained that uh, throughout his life, it, that interest in uh, not just Indian culture, but Indian religions or non-Western religions, let's say. So the point is, is that I was part of that milieu where I wanted to find out about Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, not so much Islam for some reason. I guess it was a major religion, so it wasn't quite so cool to be studying Taoism, right? So... Uh, I remember uh, one of the few professors' name I remember, Willard Johnson. I think he had just gotten his PhD. He was the one that was teaching uh, religious uh, in the Department of Religious Studies, Asian religion. So I went out and uh, bought a couple of different translations of the I Ching, that's spelled I in English, I C H I N G, otherwise known as the Book of Changes. And um, I asked him which is the best version. He gave me the academic gold standard, which today is, still remains the, the, the number one, the best translation. It's the Wilhelm Baines translation published by Princeton University Press as part of their 
their bowling uh, series. It's subsidized because you don't make any money on these this type of scholarship, right? So I have that book. Um, I bought a couple of copies over the years. I still have mine and keep it in uh, pristine shape. Um, and it was one of my uh, prized possessions as a 17-year-old freshman at uh, Cal State Long Beach. Um, interestingly enough, this is a uh, surprisingly, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but you know, we're talking about Cal State here and, and back then, uh, it was pretty rigorous. It was high level. It's not the Cal State of, of today where it's uh, PC and, you know, if you have a pulse, you can probably get in, uh, get gain admission, uh, to school, but maybe I'm underselling it. Um, but there was another professor who I should mention as I'm introducing the topic of the day. And his name was Professor Robert Eisenman. And I took, we were on the semester system. I took the first semester that I was there in um, the Old Testament. And uh, he was a scholar of the Bible. I think he knew ancient Greek and um, Aramaic and Latin, of course, and probably couple of the, of the modern languages, uh, German, for example, French, because these were the people that were doing the the scholarship and here in addition to people, uh, mostly uh, British at the time. Um, and then the second semester with him, I took took the course in the New Testament. They were a nice companion piece. So for a long time, I guess all of my adult and maybe even my teenage years, I've been interested in matters of the spirit, of the soul, of religion, the religious impulse. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that's the primary reason why once I went to graduate school, I was never seduced by the allure of Marxism. Certain aspects of it I was because I was told that religion is false consciousness, right? It's a diversion. It's keeping the masses, the people away from the inevitable, I use that quotation marks ironically, right? The inevitable, inevitable world re revolution where the proletariat will assume its rightful place as the engine, the motor of human evolution, taking us to a higher state of uh, social, cultural, and, and of course, economic organization. Where have we heard that promise before? So it was my interest and my background and my, my steadfast interest, intellectual, academic interest in, in religious studies that I think shielded me from being uh, brought into what is a form of, um, as it turns out, um, uh, secular religion with, of course, um, in some cases, a, an explicit atheist um, purport, for example, in, um, I think, all the communist states today, the ones that are left, there is no um, real support of religion. I think Putin has kind of backed away from a little bit. He, he hasn't established the Eastern Orthodox Church as an official religion, but he's uh, not going around jailing people for uh, worshiping you know, in public. In fact, he's clamped down on people like um, certain cults that have gone into Russia uh, in order to proselytize, to break up the country, or little um, provocateur groups, whoever was behind them, so-called pussy riot that, that uh, went into churches and were staging their little performance art. There's a whole other movement, by the way, which I'll talk about in some future episode, perhaps called performance studies. And uh, it's these people who are helping to stage all these antifa, all these street actions, all this agitprop. It comes out of something called uh, performance, not drama, not theater, but performance. And I had a colleague who, uh, of, of questionable background, I always suspected her. <laughs> she ran off. She disappeared one day and became a performance uh, professor of performance at NYU, but not before she studied Professor Hamamoto very carefully and, and got into my material in my way of doing business. So anyway, I'll write about her later and her, um, uh, the, uh, that, that whole field of so-called performance studies. So anyway, this is how I uh, came across um, C.G. Jung through the Book of Changes because he, for the Wilhelm or Wilhelm Baines 
edition, he wrote the introduction to it. And he talked about not just religious scholars, but intellectuals and artists of the time, poets, for example, musicians. And they were very, very much in tune with what was going on in East Asia and um, South Asia, India, China in particular, and to uh, a great extent, Japan as well. Now, Britain was more interested in their they were interested in these areas as well, but they, they had a, a greater grasp of what was going on in their colonial possessions in uh, the Mediterranean and, and North Africa. But, but they, were, they can also be credited, the, the British, with uh, a lot of scholarship and, and research in this area. But anyway, C.G. Jung, like any other uh, intellectual or professional or artist or writer, novelist, poet, is a person of his or her time. You know, the Germans have a term, zeitgeist. I'm sorry, that term's been overused now, but, and I, I don't even like to use it anymore because it's been debased by this fellow who made a, a terrible documentary appropriating that concept. But uh, it comes out of um, a German um, historical study that, that there's this concept called zeitgeist with most, with most, which most of you are familiar with. So he's very much part of that. And I state this because um, for uh, the modern period of time, this is the modern age, and this includes the U S uh, the West and the East as uh, Rudy, the Kip, Richard Kip, Kipling were a lot closer than the imperialists would have, like to to believe uh, the the new world order is is a new, is an old order. It's uh, centuries old, and there have always been people. When I say always, preceding Jung by by uh, centuries, always people who are interested in these what we consider to be arcane forms of knowledge or occult knowledge, and he's one of them. Uh, and why don't we know him as an occultist until recently? Well, I'll get into that in a moment. A lot of it had to do with the bias towards the emerging sciences, the hard sciences, which became the new God. Um, and that's where we stand here in 2020. So towards um, toward this, um, excuse me while I reach down for the book, toward the discussion, let me introduce um, Lynn Brunet, uh, The Answer to Jung. It's published by Routledge, just came out last year. And it's a very, very dense book. It's less than 200 pages long, but I'm going to be spending a lot of, a lot of time on, on this particular book. So let me just um, review some of the highlights and explain why a, a new look at Jung is so important to us in the year 2020. Politically important, not just metaphysically, not just from the terms of the scholarship, not just for for uh, our own self-gratification, but for our survival as, as, a, as a republic, the American Republic I'm talking about. Now, before I go, one more last point here, uh, before I launch into the book itself, I think apart from an incredible insight that Brunet, her brunette comes up with, I think, as I alluded to earlier, that one of her most important contributions in writing in this area is that she is helping with this book, is helping to break down the resistance to study of the occult in the academic world. And I started this talk early talking about the, this phrase that was coined by the CIA, as most of you know, this phrase conspiracy theory, right? This is how I was uh, viewed when I was at uh, the University of California, Davis. Uh, even though they had a couple of people who might have fit that description who were very well recognized and rewarded, but they happened to be in the mental health field. And you, 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 you've never seen a, uh, a group of people that are more paranoid and, and conspiracy minded than uh, these mental health professionals. But anyway, She's helping to break down the, uh, the barriers here. And the reason I mention this is I'm going to go into this at uh, future talks. Um, the hermetic tradition, Gnosticism, and I don't subscribe to, to any of these necessarily, but I, I'm interested in how they play out in the political realm. Because you can talk about machines, you can talk about technologies, 
you can talk about the mechanics of our oppression, right? All the surveillance and the quantum computers and communication devices and the internet every, and all that. But there's, a, there's another dimension equally as important, and that's the occult, that's the metaphysical, because this is what motivates these individuals who are behind companies like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, um, YouTube, you know, all, all of these, the, the, the tech people, um, to, to some extent, subscribe to a, an occult belief system in which, guess what? They're the gods, and uh, <laughs> we're, we're next to nothing. We're just a means to an end, I guess. So anyway, I'll get more into that in a moment. I should state as uh, or reiterate as Brune does, I'll, I'll pronounce her name as Brune, Lynn Brune. Uh, Jung himself was a uh, clinician in psychiatry. In fact, his father had established a psychiatric clinic himself. So he's really a second generation doctor. He was also a clergyman, his father. So he's second generation. He had an interesting grandfather who I'll get, get into in a moment. And this, I think, is a one of the important contributions that the author Brené has made to this discussion of Jung and the world. But Jung was a clinician in psychiatry, and it's important to know that because when he talks about, when he writes about in the Red Book, as it's called, the Red Book, this is his personal journals that came out long after he was dead, and they, they're beautiful illustrations and, and artwork, gouache, uh, and and beautiful prose and script. Um, he, he was a, the total artist, Jung was. I don't know if he played music, but if he did, I'm sure he would have been wonderful as a melodic as well as a harmonic genius. But anyway, he came out with these notebooks um, that were collected in what he called the Red Book. He also has a collection called The Black Books, which I haven't read. I have a copy of the Red Book someplace, which um, I have not. I think I've been... Uh, been approaching it with with great deal of trepidation but i have have not cracked that open yet anyway the i mentioned this because throughout the red book jung talks about going mad he's he's in a process of of a psychic breakdown or in in the modern sense of the word dissociation which was um not not a Freudian term. See who did that? Uh, it was uh, Pierre Janet, a French psychologist who coined, who developed these co the concept of dissociation. It was also uh, Janet who de who developed, articulated the concept of the self or the subconscious, the subconscious, subconscious mind, and of course uh, Jung and people of his. Um, of his time and of, and of the present, we're interested in the subconscious mind. And I mention this because it's Freud and others that, um, and, and Jung himself, they get most of the credit for these concepts. And, and indeed, like I said, there was a whole constellation, a milieu of thinkers, uh, many women, by the way, who, who have, have gone unrecognized in, in the area of um, the history of psychology, uh, who need to be uh, read and need to be written about. And I confess, I have not read a single even essay by by Janet, and after reading the the book by Brune, you, you can bet I will. I'm going to explore him uh, quite uh, thoroughly soon, uh, because it's more than Freud and it's more than uh, Jung. Even though they're kind of like they're twinned, they're almost joined at the hip uh, <laughs> against their will, of course. <clears throat> and I'll explain their relationship in a moment. So. Uh, uh, Lynn Brunet, she has come up with a very close textual reading of the Red Book, and so close that I probably will not be able to follow every one of her arguments, but I, I, I find little gems in there that have immediate resonance uh, with myself. Now, at the outset, and again, I, as I stated myself, I'm not interested in critiquing frame, Freemasonry, neither is she. She says that within Freemasonry itself, there is a distinction between the Freemasonic thought 
that is about the cultivation of the individual, the human being, and the betterment of society. That's Freemasonry as it was practiced by the founding fathers of the United States of America, George Washington. You, you know the whole story. A lot of them were were theists, and many of them were members of uh, Freemasonic lodges, uh, both in Mother England and transported to the to the co uh, the colonies, the U.S. the American colonies. So she makes a distinction between, between that Freemasonry and what Freemasons themselves call spurious Freemasonry or false, fake Freemasonry. This is the type of Freemasonry that was in, infiltrated by different forces. And we see that in, in the best of institutions, churches, universities, uh, the military, you name it, wherever there's power and access and maybe privilege and maybe money, You'll always have these <laughs> forces that come in to try that that attempt to steer it in, in, in a way that will benefit themselves. <clears throat> so we, we have to be on guard about that. And in, indeed, some of the uh, colonial fathers were warning us way back then uh, to beware of some of these um, these infiltrators. <clears throat> So the spurious Freemasonries, uh, Mason, Masonic persons, they are dedicated to, quoting Brune, splitting the psyches. And this is where the bells ring for me, splitting the psyches of the human being. And it splits them into the normal, inoffensive, Mr. Nice Guy, Mrs. Nice Guy, right? The person, your, your neighbor. It splits them from that into the antisocial, cynical, dark, perhaps even evil self. That is the goal of the spurious uh, Freemasonic uh, agenda, that distinction there. Now, I alluded to C.G. Jung's grandfather earlier. Guess what? And this, there's a, been a lot written about this, but she goes through the implications, Brune does, the implications of his grandfather being, you guessed it, a Freemason. Not only was he a Freemason, but he was the grand master of the Swiss Lodge. Young was Swiss by nationality, by, by the way, just to, to clarify that. And um, being in Switzerland, it also had uh, influences of, of the uh, Germanic forms of, of um Illuminist thought and, and Freemasonic thought, and a little bit of the French as well. Um, so anyway, that was that's his heritage. In addition to that, and I remember this from reading biographies of Jung in the past, his mother had psychic powers, and Jung himself had what they call second sight. And even as a youth, as a child, he was very much attuned to... Um, to other worlds and other realities, in addition to the fact that he was trying to absorb Christian, Orthodox Christian, Protestant, albeit um, theology, right? His, his, he comes from a family of uh, clergymen. So that was very much part of his makeup. So he was, he was always kind of open. He had that portal open that was not entirely closed off. He suppressed it, I think, for reasons, professional reasons, which I'll get to in a moment. But here is the, the grand wazoo, the great reveal by Brunet. She claims that the Red Book can be read as an index, an insight to secret initiatory practices that Jung himself was subjected to as a child before he could really put together what he was experiencing before even he had the power of speech and, and, and rational thought, he was being subjected to secret initiatory, traumatic initiatory practices. And ladies and gentlemen, what does that remind you of in the years leading up to 2020? Yes, yes, we're talking about ritual abuse, and we're talking about this larger process of compromise that Sonny Representative Sonny Bono was on the trail of years ago. Because it wasn't just about gun running and tr drug trafficking. It was also about human trafficking. It was also about child uh, sexual trafficking that, that he was uh, investigating. He was about to blow the lid off of it, apparently. 
but this is very much in today's headlines. And God bless President Trump and the First Lady Melania Trump because they made this one of their priorities to follow up on these wild and wacky conspiracy theories that were being bruited about and being pushed aside by all the pundits and and the newspaper people. And of course, academics are their ultimate cover. In fact, there was this one woman at, at UC Davis who evaluated my work, who wrote a dissertation about conspiracy theory that was sort of favorable to it. But once she uh, struck up a relationship with one of her professors there at UC Davis in the history department and then married him and then became a professor at UC Davis, and then she herself became the chairman of the history department. She did a 180 degree turn and she became one of the most ardent foes of quote unquote conspiracy theory that you could ever imagine. By the way, that happens a lot in academia. I, those, that's my competition that I'm dealing with. So I, I have to, <laughs> I have to be a lot better with them in, in other areas such as this uh, in order to uh, get over on them. And um, believe me, um, I, I enjoy that, getting over on them. Uh, so anyway, getting back to on, on track here. Uh, in reading uh, this, this other book, let's see if I have it here. Um, some, I, I'd like to introduce you to this particular book. It's worth reading. And I was pleasantly surprised. I, I, I'm always astounded by, by pieces of work that just kind of jump out at you. And that's one of the reasons why I keep at it, like whether it's music or art or, or literature, you know, fiction or, or scholarship. I, I really enjoy that shock of surprise. This was a really surprising find. It's called The Jesus Gene. And I think I was surprised because I don't think it's the best title for this book. It's really an excellent piece of scholarship. I could recommend it. But it talks about the evolution, the historical evolution and, and the genealogy, the, the blood genealogy, genes, G-E-N-E, -E, right? As in DNA, the heritage of, of the Knights Templar and its intersection with Freemasonry and also the the possible intersection with the the rabbinical bloodline uh, amongst Jews, uh, the Kohanim, the Cohen family. They're known as Cohen, but they're, they're Kohanim collectively, right? So he goes through all this, and um, it's uh, or the, the authors here, and uh, it's a fascinating study. And and through him, I came across a an American uh, free Masonic thinker. His name's Albert Mackey, and it's here that I realized, oh, this is where. Um, uh, what's his name? I can't remember the, the figure, the, the modern figure who got most of his material from. It was it was Mackey, the the, the, the Freemasonic uh, thinker here. Anyway, that the name will come back to me in a moment, or you can put it in the chat if you if you think you know who I'm talking about. He was out in L.A. I read a couple of bios of him for I can't like for some reason I, his name slips my mind, but he was one of the more important um, expositors of uh, Freemasonic ritual and symbols. And by the way, I remember that when I was an undergraduate and even a little bit of graduate school, the school of studying rituals and symbols uh, was and myths were, was really, very really important in, in the examination of culture, literature, music, and related expressive forms. But then uh, partway through graduate school, all of a sudden there was this wave of quote-unquote theory with a capital of capital T that threw all that out the window. And now I'm beginning to think that that was intentional because if you do study myth, ritual, symbolism, you will unveil, you will get to the secrets of, of civilization and you will understand the, the inner workings of power in, well, it's cross-cultural. Cross-cultural, you will understand how power operates through, through symbols and myths and uh, and tales and narratives and stories uh, throughout the world. It's a cross-cultural universal. So they brought us uh, Foucault and uh, uh, Paul Demon and all these other people. These, this is courtesy of the, I think, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency through uh, Yale and Johns Hopkins and all these other schools. And of course, they filtered throughout the, and, and that's where they stand today. And they're, they're going to be pushed out the door if I have anything to say about it. 
uh, in exchange for a return to to the classics and occult occultic looks at uh, reality because I think this is how we'll understand power and this is how we'll be able to to adequately uh, address and um, even vanquish uh, the evildoers that, that are running the world in uh, the 21st century, the first two decades of the, of the 21st century. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to, since I'm kind of running out of time here, I'm going to skip through this. Um, uh, I talked about Genet already. And um, let me skip to uh, another personal encounter that I had concerning traumatic initiatory rituals. And this took place almost two years ago now, January 2019, in my own backyard, January 2019, Davis, California. And Davis is really close. It's right over the causeway from uh, Sacramento, California sort of equidistance between the Bay Area and uh, Lake Tahoe. Well, not quite. It's There's still quite a distance to go to, to get to Lake Tahoe. But anyway, that's Davis. It's a farming community historically. Now it's known for its its uh, university, the, the UC. Anyway, about, uh, January 2019 was when I went to, I was invited to a talk given by Randall Noblet or Noblet. I might be mispronouncing his name, excuse me, or he goes by Randy. And um, his wife and professional collaborator, Pamela Perskin, were there. And that was only Randy that gave the talk. And um, I happened to have it on tape, I, you know. So it's a one hour talk, and it's incredible. And they are the authors of a, a really interesting, I think, an important piece of scholarship. And the title is cult and ritual abuse. And this is the culmination of their research spanning years and years. I think Randy Noblet uh, comes out of the U.S. Air Force. He's a therapist there. I think he most of his clinical work was, uh, or his professional work was, was spent in, in the military. And uh, he gave an incredible um talk about his research and about all the opposition that he had faced and in, 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 in doing this type of work. And when I say opposition, I'll tell you the, the primary phrase that will be thrown in your face if you even raise this to, to the doubters out there. And there are fewer and fewer of them all the time, the more that, it, that it's revealed, right? With uh, Jeffrey Epstein and all these, these other characters that are out there. Uh, but they will try to play it off as, here's the phrase, moral panic, right? This whole epidemic supposedly of, of child abuse and abduction and uh, trafficking of, of children is just a moral panic. It doesn't really exist. The McMartin Preschool, uh, which, by the way, uh, our friend, uh, Officer, FBI Officer, um, Ted Gunderson was um, involved in investigating, I believe. That's nothing but a, a, uh, a result of the moral panic amongst parents who felt guilty that they had to go to work and couldn't take care of their children as, and watch them and protect them as close. You know, there's all kinds of evasion. So there's this whole body of literature that are predicated upon this, this specious, uh, specious notion of all this being the product of, of the imagination and of moral panic. <coughs> Excuse me, let me. <clears throat> let me soothe my throat, thank you. So anyway, uh, I had a chance to uh, chat very briefly with uh, Randy and uh, I got my, I had taken the <coughs> I had taken the time to order the book and I had it in my possession by the time the talk rolled around. I brought it with me. I had Randy sign it and scribe it. And I saw Pamela sitting there, uh, not really <laughs> trying to uh, occupy the spot. I went over there and I said, please, uh, Dr. Perskin, could you sign my copy of your book? And she's, oh, no, she's, oh, I'm, I'm just the secretary. And I said, no, no, I know better than that. Please, please sign the book. So 
anyway, we, we had a, a short chat and, and I learned a lot. I won't go into the, the particulars of it. It's a quite interesting group of people there. Most of them were uh, therapists, I believe, and most of them were trying to, to answer certain practical questions that were or issues that were that were coming up in their clinical practice. Um, some of them talked about that in, in openly, and it was quite interesting to see what they had to have to um, endure. And this got me to start revising my thoughts about the the, the scope and the depth of this problem of uh, child abuse uh, in in American society, and I think it seems to be an international problem. Um, I had already had a great deal of skepticism towards certain institutions, uh, church, mostly church and religious and certain civic organizations, uh, civil um, institutions like Child Protective Services. I, I mean, I was aware of that, but I got some interesting insights into the clinical dimensions of this problem and the implications of it. So um, what I'm interested in here is um, why Jung? Why Freud? Why? How did they become superstars? How are these individuals put forward as being the genius? And and I'm not trying to to uh, you know who am I after all? <laughs> trying to uh, um, in any way diminish their their legacy and their output. These these are giants. They're intellectual and creative giants in, in anybody's. A book, right, in including my my own. But nonetheless, you you should know that these individuals are also fabrications, uh, not meaning they're false, but they're they're created. How are they created? Very quickly. Uh, number one, it's through institutional support. Institutions decide on who's going to be the winner, just like a. Uh, we're learning in our electoral system. It's already predetermined who's going to be the president of the United States, unless you're Donald J. Trump and you completely uh, take them by surprise, as in the uh, 2016 election. You got institutional support. Uh, in this case, it's the university. You have um, professional societies. Uh, I was watching a, a talk given by a uh, self-professed Jungian. He's the president of the the Jung Analytic Psychology Association. I didn't even know it existed, but there's about 3,000 members. So, And these societies are, are very important. Maybe they have their own little ritual initiation uh, protocols that, that I don't know of. I, I don't really know because I was never extended the secret, or at least um, I was, perhaps I was, and I didn't know it. I didn't take the handshake. So this university, in the case of, let's say, Sigmund Freud, in 1909, he was invited from, um, I guess he was living in Vienna at the time, but he was invited to the United States, to Boston, and he went to Clark College. And uh, who was the individual? I think it was um, a guy named Hall, G.B. Hall, H.T. I can't remember his initials, Hall, but he was the promoter of Freud in America. And what he was trying to do was to use Freud as a bulwark against this psychic phenomena craze. It was more than a craze. It was part of the, the dominant culture of the elite classes. They were into rapping, you know, table moving and psychic phenomena and palm reading. And, and um, it, it was uh, – Houdini came later, you know, of course, and that was very much consistent with – with the intense cult American in, uh, interest in the metaphysical and the transcendental. And I think it goes back to colonial times. America has always rested on these foundations of, of the spirit, of the unseen. And it had to undergo a complete revolution in thought and behavior in order for the scientific dictatorship to be brought in. So this guy, G.B. Hall, used Freud in order to push out all what he called as the fake psychics. And there were a lot of fake ones. A lot of it was, uh, had to do or, or dealt with uh, trickery and uh, fakery, right? But he saw them as an impediment to the larger transition, another reset. This is going to be the technology reset that was going to be brought in. And they needed someone who 
could profess scientific rigor in areas of psychic and psych, psych, psychology, right? And their man was none other than Sigmund Freud. And in order for him to be elevated to that status, and a lot of you already know this, he depended, Freud depended on his nephew. His name was Edward Bernays. And Edward Bernays was the father of modern propaganda. He wrote a little pamphlet that's back in print now called Propaganda. It was for the field. But he was his uncle Ziggy's PR man. And he also helped uh, Sigmund Freud get a lot of uh, publication, translation, and royalties from American publishers. So these ha are how these superstars, as we call them today, are, um, are created, as well as being, in their own right, people of incredible accomplishment. Uh, so you have a clergy, you have a government, self-promotion is very important, and, and uh, uh, Jung was a very, uh, very successful self-promoter. Uh, his personal magnetism and charisma, what, from what people have, have written, uh, is uh, probably something along, along the lines of a Rasputin, although he, he wasn't uh, evil like that individual. He had that type of that appeal to, uh, to, be, to, to everybody, men and women and children, and, but particularly women. Uh, and this is shown in a movie called, what is it, A Dangerous Profession, that was directed by David Cronenberg, by the way. The guy that um, that directed, he's a Canadian director, that uh, directed uh, Naked Lunch, William Burroughs, and um, uh, Videodrome, starring uh, Deborah Harry. He, he does a lot of creepy movies, and uh, this was one of his more mild movies. And it'd be interesting for those of you who are uh, of this uh, inclination to really study where, where does David Cronenberg come from? Uh, is you know what university? What what mind control program is he? Was he put through? But he's definitely some, someone uh, uh, who who deserves uh, scrutiny or some sort of biographical research. If you find out, please let me know. Share that with me, and maybe we can do a joint presentation once I get the technology in place here. Also, so we have self-promotion, self-advertising, PR. We have also the service to the state. Psychology was very important to the state, to the government, especially in World War I. That's the milieu out of which all these shell-shocked working class people who were fighting the wars of the capitalism, both German, French, and, and uh, English, and Welsh and Irish, you know, British people, uh, fighting it for the, for, the, uh, for the central bankers. And they came home... Uh, you know, as we use the term today, trauma, although that didn't exist back then. That's where Tavistock comes from, by the way, that, that era. And then World War II, uh, the Korean War in the U.S., and Vietnam, and, and on and on. Psychology performed a very important service to the state. And later on, the state figured out that how they could use this research they got from military men, the wounded men, and and, and apply it to uh, to manipulate the larger uh, civilian society. And that's where we're, we're at today in uh, 2020. And that brings me to the four. There are more points, but I just limited it to four. The fourth reason why these certain individuals come to the fore is that, and why psychology in particular became the preferred language, right? We talk about anxiety and identity crisis and... Uh, the uh, the subconscious. I mean, all these terms are part of our our way of understanding the world. All this mumbo jumbo, right? And I use these terms interchangeably and discriminate myself. You know, I'm I'm no different than than anyone else. But what it has done, psychology, psychotherapy in particular, it has been a great weapon, a great tool in pacifying middle-class professionals, especially after psychology, psychotherapy became wed to pharmaceuticals, the big pharma industry. Once those two got together, good night, Miss Ann. It was all over. And that's why I have this uh, jaundiced, skeptical uh, understanding or non-appreciation of, of therapy because I think they sold out of that. Once they joined big pharma, uh, they lost uh, legitimacy, at least in my mind. Uh, okay, let me let me conclude with uh, the present here with a short 
reading of our text right here. And as I stated in the previous talk, I'm going to try to get Lynn Brunet. I'm going to try to find where she is and see if I can get her to do a, an interview with me for your benefit, for our benefit, because I think she has a lot to offer, not just the academic world, but but to the, the world of political and economic turmoil, the Great Reset, as has been called. I think she has a lot to to offer us. So let me just read an extended passage before I sign up for today from the Brunet book. And this relates very much to um, the revelations of uh, child trafficking and abduction, ritual child abuse. It also relates a lot to a lot of the UFO phenomena, right? So reading from Brunet, it says, Just as the table-turning practices of mediums during the latter 19th century were often effective on vulnerable, grieving individuals, but were proven to be the product of clever tricks and sleight of hand, so too the ritual abuse of children is laden with similar trickery that combined with the use of drugs, dissociation, and hypnosis can easily fool children into believing a whole raft of extraordinary scenarios. It is not uncommon, as the literature of ritual abuse describes, for children to be persuaded into thinking that they have been abducted by aliens in spaceships or have had their organs removed magically, leaving no marks, or have had, had a bomb placed inside them that would explode if they ever told anyone, and so on. Such strategies aimed at confusing the children so that their stories are unbelievable and the secrecy of the perpetrating organizations is protected. And ladies and gentlemen, I will leave you with this thought. Do you not think that we, the American people and people all over the world, are currently being sub- Objected to an internet based so called social, anti social media based form of traumatic initiation into the great reset? Yes. I'll let you answer that question for yourself. With that, I bid you good night on this Sunday, December 27th, year 2020. And I hope to see you soon. I'm interested in your comments. Let's get let's get together, neighbors, right quick, and uh, let's make America great again. Again, thank you very much. Good night.